All right, we're starting now. We just talked about Cinch and Kosh a little bit. What else do you want to discuss? Can we do integration by parts? Yes. One of the folks back home says, can we do an uh, integration by parts example? I would love to. How about, I'll just invent something here. X squared e to the 4x dx. This is uh, integration by parts. So one thing that you're going to have to do on the test, or you might, is look at the thing and decide for yourself which of the methods you're going to use. Are you going to, for instance, if, if you just see this out of nowhere, I might not tell you, you, you know, use integration by parts. You'll have to decide, is this one going to be a parts or a trigonometric integral? This one is, is definitely not a trigonometric integral, which would be powers of sines and cosines. Is this a trig substitution? It's not. The only trig substitutions that I'm going to put on the test involve the square root of something minus x squared, and you don't see that here, so this is not that. Is it a partial fractions? No. Partial fractions is used only when you have a fraction of polynomials. So given that it's not any of those other things, um, you might as well try to do integration by parts here. So this is the one. Yeah. This is the typical, um, not always, but when you see multiplication inside the integral, integration by parts should, should occur to you that maybe that's what you should do. Although, if it were something like sine squared x times cosine squared x, uh, you should not use integration by parts there, even though this is also multiplication inside the integral. That is, you should do the trigonometric integral tricks. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and sometimes even if there's multiplication inside the integral, it will just be a plain u substitution. Although on, on, for the purposes of this test, I'm not going to put one like that on there. So you'll have a little, uh, a little uh, easier time deciding which is which. Anyway, this is going to be parts. So you must remember the integration by parts formula. Integral of u dv is uv minus integral v du. And you look in your two parts, you know, generally you're going to have two things multiplied together, so it's not so hard to decide. These are my two parts in this example. One is x squared, the other is e to the 4x. And then, which is which? In general, you want the u to be something which gets simpler when you take its derivative. And you want the dv to be something which gets simpler or maybe stays the same when you take its integral. So, in this case, I'm going to choose... Anybody remember how to choose these? What should I pick for the u? Something which gets simpler when you take the derivative. Yeah, how about x squared? When I take the derivative of x squared, it becomes 2x, which I don't really like the 2, but at least it's not in the exponent. So, Right, eventually you can... Co coefficient is not a big deal. You can take it out of the integral. So I'm going to choose u equal x squared, dv equals e to the 4x dx. You always have to include the the dx in, as part of the dv part. Okay, and then, in order to plug into the integration by parts, we need to find the du, which is just 2x dx, and the v will be the integral of e to the 4x dx. And this is, uh, this appears in the list of formulas I said I was going to give you. 1 fourth e to the 4x. Uh, in that list there, you will see integral e to the kx is 1 over k e to the kx. This one comes up uh, fairly often. When you're doing integration by parts, also you, you often use that in the um, improper integrals. Anyway, these are the u's and the v's and all that. Okay, so we're going to plug into my integration by parts formula. So I go uv minus integral v du. And we get u is x squared. v is 1 fourth e to the 4x minus integral v, 1 fourth e to the 4x, du is 2x dx. All right. This is the first step of the integration by parts. So we still have an integral sign in there, so we still have to do this integral, but we can maybe try and simplify as much as we can before doing the integral. I'll write this first thing as 1 fourth x squared e to the 4x, and then to simplify here, you can pull the constants out. I have a 1 fourth that will factor out, and also a 2 that will factor out, so it comes out as like 1 fourth times 2, which is a half. So it's going to say minus a half integral. And what's left over inside is e to the 4x and also a x. 
I like to write it this order. doesn't really matter, though. x e to the 4x. And now we have to do that integral. And what do you think? How do we do this integral? x times e to the 4x. Do you have to do a u substitution? Uh, your choices would be maybe u substitution or maybe do the parts again. Um, you could try u substitution, but it won't work. If, if you choose u to be 4x, the du will not give you anything with the x. Yeah, you got to do the parts again. This is, um, if you look what happened from here to here, it looks kind of the same, only the, the uh, power on x has decreased by 1. If we do it one more time, then the x will just go away entirely, and then it'll be easy to do. So we're going to do parts again. Sometimes you got to do it again. So again, I choose my u and my dv. This time I'm going to choose u to be x, so that when I do dx, it just goes away completely. D sorry, du is just equal to dx. Du equals dx, right? And then dv is going to be e to the 4x. And then v will be the integral of that, which is the same thing that I did in the first step, 1 4 e to the 4x. And so I end up with 1 4 x squared e to the 4x, that was there before, minus 1 half, and then I put my parts again, u v minus integral v du. So it's going to be x, uh, u is x, v is 1 4 e to the 4x, minus integral v du, 1 4 e to the 4x, times dx. Again, we have an integral that remains to be done, but this time it's going to be easy. We can factor the 1 fourth out and then just do the integral of e to the 4x. So let me just, I'll factor it out first. x squared e to the 4x minus 1 half. Then I've got 1 fourth x e to the 4x. Okay, minus. Now I'm going to factor the 1 fourth out of that integral sign. What remains is just e to the 4x dx. And then finally, this will be the end, you do that last integral, the integral of e to the 4x, again, is 1 fourth e to the 4x. So this is going to be my final answer. 1 half x squared e to the 4x minus 1 half times 1 fourth x e to the 4x minus 1 fourth times 1 fourth e to the 4x. The end. And I put the plus c on, on everything. That's that. This is, uh, this is maybe, a, I mean, not, not particularly hard, but kind of long-winded just because you have to do it twice. Typical example of an integration by parts that you might see on the test. Any questions about any of those steps? Uh, sometimes, if it's an integration by parts, I might give you, like, um, boundary values on the integral sign. Uh, if you want to do one like that, you just do all of this stuff again, uh, only at the very end, instead of putting plus C, you, you put the bar with the two values and you plug the two values in. So there's no real surprises there. It's just a little bit of extra work at the end. You have to plug the two values in. As usual, I don't care if you try to simplify your answer. I would expect you, for instance, for this problem, I would expect you to just leave your answer looking like that. What else can we talk about? You want to go over these tricks for the trigonometric integrals? Those ones are a little a little tricky. You just have to remember how to do them. Should we try some of those? Yeah, let's try some of those. So there are two different tricks. One is if one of the powers is odd, then that's a, a certain trick that you use. And the other trick you use when both of the powers are even. So let's try, maybe we could just do one of each. Um, when one of the powers is odd, so let's say, as usual, I'll leave the one on the paper for you all to do. How about this? One of the powers there is odd. The other is even. Even. 
Actually, this is going to be a bit of a pain. Could I change cosine to the 4 to a cosine squared? When those powers are... Actually, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Let's leave it as a 4. Sorry. Yeah, I don't think that's going to be a, a big issue. Uh, anybody remember the trick for this? The save one trick, yeah. So the idea is, this is the slogan, save one. Um, you look at the odd one, first of all, and you save one of those. So here I have like three signs is the idea. And you save one of those signs, um, and then you change, uh, change the other ones into cosines. So I'm going to say this is going to be, I think of it as sine squared x and then cosine to the 4x and then the point of saving one is that it comes, I put it with the dx, and that's going to become the du in a u substitution. And what do I do with the other signs? So this is, this is like the one that I saved, right? What do I do with the other signs? I turn them into cosines by doing sine squared equals 1 minus cosine squared. So this becomes 1 minus cosine squared x. And then I have cosine to the 4x, sine x dx. And now we do a u substitution, u equals cosine x, du equals negative sine x dx. And this is why we saved one, because this is the du now. And so I'm going to do my u substitution, plug everything in. Where I see cosine, that becomes a u. And where I see sine x dx, that becomes a du. It's actually negative du. It's not a big deal. So this is 1 minus u squared times u to the 4. <clears throat> and then sine x dx is times negative du. Don't forget the minus in there because the derivative of cosine is negative sine. All right. Now what? Now it's all just polynomials. So how would I do this integral? Yes, she said distribute the u to the fourth, and then it just looks like an ordinary polynomial, and everything works great. Uh, actually, when I distribute, I'm going to distribute this. Um, so I'm, I'm distributing like, come on, like so, all right? And I'm going gonna, gonna to bring the minus sign along with it when I distribute, just so I don't have to worry about that anymore. So it's going to become integral of negative u to the four plus u to the six du. All right. <clears throat> And we just do the uh, antiderivative then becomes minus one fifth u to the five plus one seventh u to the seven plus c. And then finally you replace the original variable. So u is equal to cosine of x. So my final answer is minus a fifth cosine to the five x plus one seventh cosine to the seven x plus c. And that's that. All right, so this trick is how you do it when one of the powers is odd. You keep one of those powers off to the side as part of the du, and then you rewrite everything in terms of the other trig function. Any questions about that one? All right, when they're both even, you must use a totally different trick. So in the paper, it says sine squared x times cosine squared x. Maybe we'll try, um, how about, I don't know, sine to the 4x times cosine squared x. This one's going to be a little nastier. I actually don't like doing these with big powers. Um, anyway, you're going to use the formulas uh, that you'll see on the, um, on the sheet under the formulas I will give you. Formulas concerning sine squareds and cosine squareds. Hopefully this one won't be too nasty. The idea is you use those formulas there concerning sine squareds and cosine squareds to rewrite everything in terms of ordinary sines and cosines. Um, so, for instance, cosine squared, what I'm going to do with that is I just change it into 1 half 1 plus cosine 2x, right? 
Uh, what do I do with sine to the 4 of x? You think of that as sine squared of x, the whole thing squared. And again, you use the formula on the paper for sine squared of x. So this becomes integral of sine squared x. I put in there 1 half, 1 minus cosine 2x, right? And then that's going to get squared. And then I have cosine squared of x, which will be uh, times 1 half, 1 plus cosine 2x, right? dx. Uh, now I can see this This is going to get a little stupid. This example is going to be harder than one which I would give you on the test, and, and, and we'll see why in a moment. But anyway, how we would continue here was, would be you have to actually square this out, and then I'm going to multiply it times this. There's going to be a sort of a, a big and nasty foiling that has to be done. So actually squaring this out. First of all, the one-half will get squared, and I get one-fourth. And then I square the rest of it, I'm doing 1 minus cosine of 2x, the whole thing squared. So it's like this, 1 minus cosine 2x times another, 1 minus cosine 2x. What does that look like? Uh, when you do the foil on the front, I get 1. On the inside, I get minus cosine 2x. And on the outside, I also get minus cosine 2x. So this becomes minus 2 cosine 2x. And then on the, uh, the last terms, I get cosine 2x times cosine 2x is plus cosine squared 2x. And then that is going to be, like it was before, times 1 half, 1 plus cosine 2x, dx. All right. And then we got to do another big foil, unfortunately. So I'm going to, first of all, the 1 fourth and the 1 half can just pull all the way out of the integral, and I get an eighth. And then in here, we have to distribute these, these three things over those two things, which is going to make six things in the answer. Um, the first one will be 1 times 1. That's just a 1. Then I'm going to do, let's go through with, with the first 1 here and multiply with each of the two parts. So it's 1 first and then uh, 1 times cosine 2x. So that's just cosine 2x. And then I multiply negative 2 cosine 2x times each of the things in the other one. It's going to be negative 2 cosine 2x minus 2 cosine squared 2x. And then finally, the last term here, cosine squared 2x, multiplies onto each of these two. I get plus cosine squared 2x plus cosine cubed 2x. And this, this here is why this will not appear on the test, because it's another formula uh, that sort of belongs in this list on the paper, but I, I didn't go that far on the paper. I will tell you, though, cosine cubed of 2x is um, what is cosine cubed of 2x? Actually, I don't even know if there is a nice formula for that. Yeah, this actually, you do, you do the, the save one trick on that. You keep a cosine, the other cosine squared, you write as a sine squared. This is this is uh, quite a bit more complicated than I would make you do on the, um, on the test. Could we just, um, so this would have been less complicated if that were not a 4 to begin with, right? If it were a 2, but that's the one on the paper, so I didn't want to do the one on the paper for you. Um, anyway, can we, I, I'm going to try and do my best. To, I'm not, I'm, I'm just going to bail out on that last term there. Like I said, it's, it, I mean, it's possible to do. I don't think it's worth spending all the time to do it, but um, how would you finish at least the rest of this problem? I have the one eighth out front, and then you just go down the list here. And um, sorry, I'm going to do a little simplification first. Integral. Okay, I have one here, and then I have. We can combine these two, right? Cosine two x minus two cosine two x. So that becomes just minus one uh, cosine of two x, right? And then I have these two cosines. I have a minus two of them, and then a plus one of them. So that's just going to be minus 1 cosine squared 2x. But that, I'm going to use the formula on the paper. So it's going to be this. This, first of all, comes together to just be minus cosine squared of 2x. But cosine squared of 2x on the paper is 1 half, 1 plus cosine of 4x. 
And then at the end, we have this cosine cubed of 2x, which I'm just going to ignore when we end up uh, doing it. Again, um, just simplifying a little bit, I can distribute the 1 half here, and then we'll be ready to do the integral apart from the last term. Minus 1 half, minus 1 half cosine 4x plus this. All right, and now, finally, I can go through and do the integral of each of those terms. Of course, the 1 just becomes a x. Cosine of 2x, I hope you remember that when you integrate something like sine of kx, the integral of sine is negative cosine, and the, fact, the, the extra k in there get, does this. So since it's sine, it becomes negative 1 over k cosine kx. The integral of cosine kx dx is just 1 over k sine of kx. All right, you will want to remember, at least the second one comes up when you're doing these problems. So when I see up here minus cosine of 2x, I get minus 1 half sine of 2x. You just have to remember to stick that, that constant on the inside becomes a multiplied constant on the outside. All right, negative a half is next, becomes negative one half x. And then minus one half cosine four x becomes minus one half times one fourth sine of four x. Plus, and I'll just, I'll just put that, that thing there. I don't want to do that. So the way you would do that if you wanted to was you do the save one trick. You save one of the cosines, you write the other one as one minus sine squared x. And then you do a U substitution. It's not so hard, but we don't need to get into it. All right. Sorry, that, that I, may be unsatisfying that I didn't finish it. But try the one on the paper. It's just like this, only a little easier. Because you don't, you don't end up with that extra piece at the end. Anybody got more thoughts about that? Or want to do something completely different? Should we try one of the trig substitutions? Those ones are also uh, require, you know, just that you remember how to do it. Um, let's try one of them. How about, so the ones um, on the paper involve x over something like that. Another one has an x squared over something. How about, let's try 1 over x. I think this will work all right. I hope so. These ones can be a little delicate, so I hope you don't, I hope you're not surprised that I sometimes mess it up when I am just trying to make up a problem on the fly. It doesn't always work out. Of course, when I'm writing the problems on the test, I will make sure that they work out nicely before I give you the test. All right, so what you have to remember, First of all, your, your hint that this is going to require the trig substitution is that. When you see that, um, you, uh, at least for the purposes of this exam, the only way to do problems that involve that is a trig substitution. So when you see that, you should think immediately to do a trig substitution. And when you see this, square root of a squared minus x squared, you use um, the trig substitution x equals a sine theta that's what's going to work out nicely so in this problem my substitution is going to say x equals a not a what is a in this case a is 3 this time you see 9 there 9 that 9 is supposed to be a squared and so 9 is 3 squared so i'm going to use 3 sine theta that means the dx will be 3 cosine theta, d theta, right? For the dx, you just take the derivative of what the x was. All right, I hope this is going to work. I don't, I don't really know. Um, we are going to plug in for these things. Do the substitution. I have 1 over, okay, x is 3 sine theta. And then I have square root of uh, 9 minus x squared, that would be 9 sine squared theta, right? And then over here, dx becomes 3 cosine theta d theta. And now I can see, I don't really like the way this looks, although it won't be so bad. 
What's going to happen when we simplify business? On the bottom, we have 9 minus the square root of 9 minus 9 sine theta. Anybody remember what to do with that? First of all, you could factor the 9 out, and it comes out of the square root and becomes a 3 because uh, it it's, gets its square root taken. So you can write 1 over 3 sine theta and then times 3 square root, 1 minus sine squared theta, 3 cosine theta d theta. What can I do with that? I'm trying to simplify that square root part. Um, something about, you can do something with 1 minus sine squared. Any folks at home want to shout it out? Actually, we kind of already did this with the trig integrals that we did. This one. Oh, we didn't exactly do it, but like sine squared is the same as 1 minus cosine squared. And 1 minus sine squared is the same as cosine squared. So down here, when you see 1 minus cosine squared, sorry, I see 1 minus sine squared. That equals cosine squared of theta. Right? Theta. I think I wrote that on the paper, actually. Yeah, you sh you, you'll need to remember to do that for the uh, trig substitution. Anyway, that means this is going to be 1 over. Can I combine the 3s together? I get a 9 sine theta. And then here I have square root of cosine squared theta, right? And then up here I have, actually, I should have canceled one of the 3s because I have a 3 up, up top. Can I just, sorry, I'm just going to erase Right, like this 3 cancels that 3, say. And I end up with just one 3 on the bottom. Okay, so I got integral 1 over 3 sine theta cosine theta. Right, square root of cosine squared is just cosine. And then I can cancel these cosines, right? I had 1 on the bottom. So it all amounts to, and let's factor the 3 out of the integral, 1 third, and then I have 1 over sine theta d theta. And this is one-third integral of cosecant theta. And this is, unfortunately, not a, an, an antiderivative that I have memorized. Um, the cosecant, I believe it's, maybe I do have it memorized. So this, this I would not expect you to know on the test. So, but um, if, I played my, uh, if I played my cards better when I started the problem out, I could have cooked it up so that this would actually be just a sine or just a cosine or something, something easy to do at the end. Um, anyway, this, I believe, is, I think that integral of cosecant x is minus cosecant x cotangent x. Can anybody confirm or deny that? I don't remember. I, I would look in the back of your book. I don't have my book with me. I think that's what it is. Anyway, assuming that that's, that's what it is, I end up with this. Um, another way of writing that, cosecant is 1 over sine, cotangent is cosine over sine. So this, uh, in other words, is, um, I believe, cosine theta over sine squared theta. If you just write the cosecant and the cotangent as sines and cosines. Almost done here. There's actually one more step, and that is I need to write the answer in terms of x, right? I began with my um, my variable was x. I need to write the answer in terms of x. And it said, how do you do that? Is a little uh, is a little tricky. Remember, x equals three sine theta. All right. Uh, that means that uh, x over three is sine theta. And so where I see sine squared in the bottom, that's easy enough. It's just um, x over three squared. Right because sine of theta is x over 3. What do I do with cosine of theta? This is a little trickier. You draw yourself a little triangle. So theta is an angle, 
and the sine of theta is x over 3. That means that the uh, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, right? So the x goes there, a 3 goes there. What's the cosine of theta? Well, it's the adjacent over the hypotenuse. You need to find the adjacent side, and because of the Pythagorean theorem, the adjacent side here will be 3 squared, which is 9 minus x squared, all right? So using the Pythagorean theorem, you find the other side, and then this tells me that cosine of theta is root 9 minus x squared over 3. And now I can plug all that stuff in. So my final answer here, replacing the cosines and sines with, with the appropriate things in terms of x. Cosine theta is root 9 minus x squared over 3, and then divide by sine theta squared. Sine theta is just x over 3, so this is x squared. Well, I'll just write x over 3 squared. And that really is my final answer. There is a fair amount of simplifying you could do if you wanted to in there, but I don't care about that. All right. That one also is in the category of similar to what you might see on the test, but this is harder. Um, ones on the test would not require you. I mean, it's not all that much harder. It's just this, this integral of cosecant. I would not expect you to know that formula. And I'm not even 100% sure that I remembered it correctly. I'm a mathematician, not a formula memorizer. There's a difference. All right. We got seven more minutes. What else can we discuss? Sequences, sure. Yeah, does the sequence converge or not? Uh, one thing you'll have to keep straight is we have rules for whether a series converges or not, and then other rules for whether a sequence converges or not, which can be a little confusing, I suppose. So if you look at these ones, um, the general rule for sequence convergence of sequences The general trick that we always use is put big stuff in denominators. So the, the classic trick involving that would be when you have a ratio of polynomials. 3n to the 4 minus 7n n squared divided by 6 plus n plus 5n to the 4, say. Put big stuff in denominators means I'm going to divide out on the top and the bottom by the highest, the biggest thing, which in this case is uh, n to the 4, the highest exponent. Although in some cases, you might have exponential functions in there, which are even bigger. But generally, divide out by the biggest thing that you see. Um, actually, you could also use L'Hopital's rule to do this, but I would prefer divide by... Um, divide by the biggest power of n. In this case, another way to say that is I'm going to multiply by 1 over n to the 4 on the top and on the bottom. Right? What happens is all those n to the 4s, um, well, 3n to the 4 just becomes 3. Then I have minus 7n squared becomes minus 7 over n squared because I dividing by n to the 4 cancels those two n's and gives me 2 in the denominator. On the bottom, I get 6 over n to the 4 plus n divided by n to the 4 is 1 over n to the 3rd, and then plus 5, just just 5. And then when you take the limit here, all those things with those denominators become 0, and all that's left is the 3 on the top and the 5 on the bottom. So this becomes 3 minus 0 over 0 plus 0 plus 5. 3 fifths is the answer. All right? And this is the general trick that you do for, for any sequence finding the limit of any sequence. All right. Um, 3 over 5 is the limit of this one, yeah. If I were look, just looking at, taking a glance at the, the ones on the paper there, the next one says 2 plus 6 to the negative n. This, uh, that's, that's very easy. Um, if you write just Write the uh, negative exponent as, a, as, as if it were a fraction. It just says 2 plus 
1 over 6 to the n, right? And what happens when n goes to infinity? That fraction becomes 0. And the answer is just 2. 2 plus 0 is just uh, 2. Um, similarly with number 19, I don't even know why I put that number 19 in there. It's just 3, right? The 1 over n part becomes 0, and you just get 3. Yeah, I just, I ruined it for you. Sorry. I think maybe the reason I, I thought that I was being clever about that is this equals 3, right? There's a difference, though, between that. So the sequence, 3 plus 1 over n, as a sequence, converges, right? But you got to be careful. This, the series, 3 plus 1 over n, this diverges because the 3 part doesn't really matter. Actually, the 3 part does matter. What you're adding together is like 3 plus something. If you write the terms out, this is 3 plus 1 plus 3 plus a half plus 3 plus a third plus. This, this, this is infinite, right? You're adding like basically 3, a little bit more than 3 every time. Infinitely many times. This, this diverges, right? Um, so when you're, when you're thinking about converging or diverging, it makes a big difference if it's just a sequence or if it's uh, that same thing inside of a summation. The, the rules are completely different. Um, so maybe I was trying to maybe trying to trying to fool you by that. I don't know. Three plus one.